storytelling sees Todd Solance at his most meta. It includes two separate narratives that both grapple with the art of crafting a tale and displays the many fictions people tell themselves. The first of the two is called Fiction and focuses on the personal turmoil of a young writer named Vi. The point of the first piece becomes apparent with this exchange, in which a young man with cerebral palsy is given feedback on his story, which is clearly based on his own experience. The story is a piece of shit. You express nothing but banalities and, formally speaking, are unable to construct a single compelling sentence. You ride on a wave of cliches so worn, in fact, it actually approaches a level of grotesquerie. And your subtitle, The Rawness of Truth. Is that supposed to be a joke of some sort? Or are you just being pretentious? In that scenario, the professor is absolutely right in his assessment, albeit of course way too blunt about it. The purpose of this scene is to ask the question, what does it mean for stories to be true or honest to the human experience? The man's story is of course true, however the way it's communicated lacks nuance and a feeling of genuine authenticity, which to some would sound odd. How can a 100% true story, communicated by the person it's based on, lack authenticity or feel dishonest? Well, the professor's comments nailed it. I mean, can you honestly listen to this and not wince? No more cerebral palsy. From now on, CP stood for cerebral person. It just fails to cut deep into any emotion due to the word choice and just being an underwhelming conveying of a deeply emotional experience. What should be a powerful story imbued with emotion and tenderness that can only be gained from lived-in experience comes off as almost laughably detached from the human condition. His peers are unable to remove themselves from the artificial weight of his story because they know it's based on his reality. Their emotions led them to believe that his writing properly conveyed said emotions through prose, which of course it didn't. The pity they felt for him before even listening to his story has infected their experience of his work, which speaks to many filmgoers and critics' experience of watching a film they know is a true story. The ending of the segment is the perfect final bow that wraps the section's themes and message up. After the class dogpiles on Vi's story, which was based on her encounter with her professor, said professor lets her in on a storytelling truth. I don't know about what happened, Vi, because once you start writing, it all becomes fiction. This is one of the most fascinating observations of the nature of storytelling that I've ever seen because of how dead on it is. It doesn't matter if what you made is 100% accurate and a true story. What matters is how the story is told that determines its relation to reality and the human experience. Take the film Compliance, which tells the true story of a man who would pretend to be a police officer in order to trick managers of fast food restaurants to tell specific female employees to do degrading acts, which they did. When I watched that film, I knew it was a true story because I had heard about the situation prior. However, the whole thing felt absurd and fake. Of course, these things actually happened. However, due to the ineptness of the director, each interaction and vile thing came off as ingenuine due to the characters themselves feeling like cardboard cutouts of the naive young woman and the bootlicker tropes. The whole affair felt phony, despite it regurgitating the actions almost verbatim, but like the professor said, once you write it, it all becomes fiction. The second story, titled Nonfiction, focuses on a documentary filmmaker and his subject, a young, directionless teen. The documentary filmmaker is clearly a stand-in for Solons, who seems to grapple with critiques of him. The criticisms levied at the documentarian's work are the exact same as what was levied at Solons' previous two films, Happiness and Welcome to the Dollhouse. It's funny, I suppose. But it seems glib and facile to just make fun of how idiotic these people are. I'm not making fun. Uh, I'm showing it as it really is. You're showing how superior you are to your subject. No, but I, I, I like my subject. I like these people. No, you don't. Yes, I do. I love them. Todd obviously does care for his characters, which is why they are often far from cliché and are three-dimensional. He uses morbid humor to disarm us, so we can examine the characters and their situations without the lens of pity. This also allows him to explore more inflammatory subjects without making the viewing experience excruciatingly depressing. However, this brings up a conflict we often see films birth, the conflict of director's intent versus the final result of said director's work. One may intend for a story to be viewed a certain way, but in the end, you're left with the results and people's own interpretation of it, which may be Todd grappling with whether or not some of the overly harsh critiques of him are valid. In the previous 
previous story, the creative writing students are obviously stand-ins for the critics of Solon's work. With them, he highlights major problems with prominent film critics, as they often are just overly mean and attack the character of the director and make assumptions about their personal lives, not to mention how often they clutch their pearls at material that actually explores societal issues without kid gloves, ironically becoming modern-age Hayes Code enforcers. Scooby's story takes aim at the facade of suburbia by showing the disconnect between the fiction and non-fiction of certain individuals that dwell there. Scooby imagines greatness for himself, despite putting little to no effort to pursue that greatness. He probably deep down knows that his parents will bail him out of any situation. Their string pulling gives him the impression that he's actually imbued with an inherent greatness that needs to be discovered by some talent agent, as is the case with many privileged individuals. The facade starts to break apart after Scooby is told that Conan O'Brien went to Harvard. The fiction that his aspirations can be accomplished with little to no effort was dispelled. The final blow to his fiction was him coming face to face with his court jester-like existence when viewing the documentary. The fiction that is the phony concern for the well-being of people from lower economic classes by suburbia and society as a whole is also taken aim at, albeit this is done passingly. The child character pretends to care about what the housemaid is going through, but then quickly asks her to clean up a spill after she's done mourning her dead grandchild. All he really cares about is making himself feel better and trying to get her not to cry so she can clean up some spilled juice. His words to her are laced with a false code of empathy, but are noticeably cruel, and when called out, he gets her fired. Most people's concerns for the underprivileged disappear the moment one makes them feel uncomfortable or affects their life in the slightest. They tell themselves the fiction that they genuinely care, but it's apparent from their actions that their conveying of this false sentiment only serves to make themselves feel or look better, rather than stemming from genuine care. Storytelling overall, while burdened by Solon's typical low budget, is a fascinating examination of the nature of filmmaking and the director himself. Do you agree with my explanation of storytelling? Comment down below if you do or don't.